Welcome back to Ahead of the Curve. I'm really excited that we have a special guest today. We're going to be exploring scoliosis, pelvic floor therapy, tongue ties, and spinal fusion, a bunch of things um, and how they all relate together. We have Dr. Laura Glazebrook here um, from Atlanta. Welcome, Laura. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> I'm excited to have you. Um, Laura and I met on Instagram, kind of like uh, the way I meet everybody these days. <laughs> it's like pandemic. It's like you are in this little Instagram social media bubble. So, um, <laughs> and we've been like following each other for a while. And then um, I've been reading the book Breath um, by James Nestor. And I've talked about it quite a bit. And I posted a photo about, um, actually, I think it was, I think it was like scolios, like it was, um, how our breath, like yes. over breathing can lead to gas exchange stuff. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> how over breathing may have a connection to, um, like bone density issues and yes, that's um, what it was. Yeah. And Laura, um, has been delving into some things with tongue ties and I've been interested in that as well through this book and just other things that I've been learning. So I'm really excited to have you here, Laura. Um, I'd love for you to just kind of tell us a little bit about you and about your Scolio journey. Absolutely. So um, I, I have had scoliosis probably my whole life. Um, I was formally diagnosed. Um, I, I mean, I think maybe they had noticed it at well visits before um, before age 11, but I went to see an orthopedist originally at 11 and got an x-ray and they determined that I had scoliosis. Um, I have a, a right curve. So, um, we, you know, at the time, this was a, a many years ago. <laughs> um, but they said, okay, well, we're going to do a six month follow-up and, and see how it looks. By the time they did the six month follow-up, it had, it was determined that I would need surgery. So it had progressed so quickly that, um, it was just, okay, well, no time for bracing. We just have to go straight to surgery. Um, and actually my, my parents told me after the fact that the surgeon who actually was pretty well known in Atlanta at the time, he was one of the best or one of at least the most prolific surgeons in Atlanta. Um, he had told them that it was one of the quickest progressions he'd ever seen. So, oh, wow. um, yeah, so here I am at 11. I do feel like maybe the tongue tie airway stuff ties into that, but we can get into that a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Um, so here I am at 11 and I have to have this giant back surgery, um, so I, you know, missed six weeks of school. I got a fusion from, it's most of my spine. So I think it's um, probably about T2 to L2. So most of the thoracic and it's part of the lumbar spine. Uh, <clears throat> so I had the surgery and, you know, wore like a little after surgery brace and missed about six weeks of school. And then um, I don't recall, and granted I was young, but I don't recall after that, you know, discharge about a year later, I don't recall them saying really anything about my back or anything to keep up with monitor pretty much at all. I remember him saying, okay, you know, avoid wooden roller coasters, avoid like gymnastic tumbling and horseback riding and then bye. <laughs> I'm like, no. Oh. Um, but you know, I was motivated to get, I was a, a ballet dancer. I was a dancer for most of my life and I wanted to get back to it. So I didn't really let it limit me. Um, I still do have a severe curve. I mean, I have uh, at the time of the fusion, I think it went from a 57 degrees at the time of the surgery. I think they got it down to the thirties. Mm -hmm. Um, but certainly my back has probably progressed since then. I need to get an updated x-ray. Um, but so I still have a severe curve, but now I just, it's fused. Mm -hmm. Um, so I still, you can definitely see that I have a scoliosis. I have, you know, one side that's way, a lot further back than the other. Um, you can't really tell looking at me from the front cause I don't have like a hip shift, but when I bend forward, you can see, Whoa, there's a scoliosis. So yeah. I, <laughs> um, I never really had any issues with my like pain or anything when I was younger, I had some headaches and things, but I think now that's kind of related to other things. But 
but a lot of my kind of issues, some of the scars that I have from my scoliosis journey have been kind of emotional and social and having people saying, you know, either intentionally hurtful things, um, which, you know, I mean, I had one kid in my middle school class who was telling people that I had like one boo was like smaller than the other, oh, but oh no, my <laughs> no, my trunk is just twisting. Yeah. So some things like that for, you know, people saying things that maybe even weren't intentionally hurtful, but you know, just that self image was always kind of a concern. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, so fast forward, I was very active throughout school. I decided, um, from my scoliosis experience, I was like, it would be cool to be a PT because, you know, they make you do PT after a fusion just to get back on your feet and do stairs and things. So um, I got my undergrad degree in exercise science, and then I went to PT school and got my doctorate in 2012. I've been, I've done a lot of different areas of PT along the way. Um, I started with like neurological illnesses and injuries, and then I branched into pelvic health um, after I, I had some issues with pain and stuff when I was pregnant. Um, so I kind of shifted gears and learned about that during my pregnancies. And then I've only found like Schroth or scoliosis specific PT. I think it's only really been about two years, two and a half years now. So then I kind of branched out and now I pretty much only do um, scoliosis treatment and pelvic treatment. Um, but so, yeah, I have a fusion. I'm a, I'm a fusion warrior. I have a bionic spine. Um, <laughs> I'm a runner, a triathlete. I lift weights. Mm -hmm. um, I'm married to my college sweetheart and I have two adorable, if not exhausting children. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, that's, that's amazing. That probably gives so many people a lot of hope um, because you're told really crazy things uh, about having scoliosis and spinal fusion, uh, just having the ability to get pregnant and have a successful pregnancy delivery and recovery afterwards. So yeah. I'd love to hear a little bit kind of about both sides of, of things. So maybe a little bit about your experience, uh, being with pregnancy and having spinal fusion and a little bit about what you've seen as far as like some trends, as far as uh, your patients that have scoliosis and pelvic floor. Um, absolutely. So you may need to rein me and I, I tend to get, this is, this is like one of my favorite passions. So I'll try to <laughs> need to rein me in. That's totally <laughs> fine. Um, yes. So I feel like, um, and for whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, um, I didn't, I didn't have really any idea of what to expect with pregnancy. I, no one had ever told me that I would not be able to, you know, get pregnant or maintain a pregnancy or have a safe delivery. No one had made, had, had really even put that into my head. So I guess that's helpful. I think these days, a lot more people, I think just in Google, I think people tend to research and think, oh, well, I won't be able to have, but I mean, I think one of the big misnomers is you it does not affect your ability to get pregnant or to carry a pregnancy. I think that's something that is not out there enough, but like a, for the majority of people, those issues like scoliosis and spinal fusion shouldn't be, that's not an impact on the actual fertility and all of that thing. I think there are things that can, you know, it does impact certain things. And I know you've talked about hormones and, and things that can be a little bit changed with scoliosis, but that's not so much the concern. The one thing that I was aware of, um, when I went into my first pregnancy is I was aware pretty quickly that because of my spinal fusion and where my scoliosis was that I would not be able to get an epidural. So I planned for that. Um, good, good. <laughs> I, yeah, so my, um, and there really wasn't a lot out there. There's still not a ton out there about scoliosis and, and spinal fusion and pregnancy. So I'm kind of working on a webinar and some content. And I know you have some things out there too. Mm -hmm. But um, I had sort of, I'd taken like a, a hypnobirthing type class. And I'd done a lot of work on, you know, how to manage labor pains and breathing and all of that. And I actually, um, 
other than, I mean, I had a little bit of pelvic girdle pain during my pregnancy, which is when I started seeing a pelvic floor therapist, Mm -hmm. uh, which I think most people these days that are within birthing age, I think are at least aware of pelvic PT and that that's an option for if you're having pain. Um, I wish I would have had some scoliosis exercises back then, but (laughs) here we are. Um, So I, for my first pregnancy, I was in active labor for about 26 hours and he was, we just, we were stalling. Um, And then I ended up in a place where the doctors were saying, okay, well, maybe if we do an epidural, well, meanwhile, I'm trying to advocate and my husband's trying to advocate for me too, because there should have been somewhere in the notes that um, this, we'd already consulted with an Mm -hmm. anesthesiologist who took one look at my back and was like, nope, (laughs) it's not an option. I'm not, I'm not going anywhere near her with an epidural needle. And so they, they actually said, well, let's just get a second opinion. So I'm in like active labor, like my body is, I'm having contractions and I'm doing, you know, I'm trying to work through all of this like intense labor stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, they got, I think another epi or another anesthesiologist in who said the same thing. And essentially what ended up happening is I was starting to fatigue. So I I ended up getting a Mm -hmm. C-section. So, but that's always, I think in the U S like about 30% of people that are having children will end up with a C-section regardless. Mm -hmm. Um, Looking back, I think there are things that I would do differently, but so anyway, I ended up with a C-section for my son. Um, Delivery was fine. He was fine. I, you know, other than recovering from an abdominal surgery, I was fine. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, there just was not a lot out there as far as even just at that time, I wasn't aware that there were people that had content on how this is how you recover after an abdominal surgery. Um, but yeah, I recovered. I didn't really have any issues postpartum. I went back to fitness within a reasonable time frame. Um, and my three years later is when I got pregnant with my daughter. Um, and I was not as fit for that pregnancy, I will admit, like I was just, you know, I had a toddler at home and just working and it was busy. So my body was not as fit the second time around. And so I started having pain a little bit sooner in that pregnancy, which impacted my fitness somewhat. So I went back to do some more pelvic PT. I, I still wasn't aware of like scoliosis specific exercise as much at that time, but I, um, so I had a second C-section because I didn't want to end up in the same boat where I labored for a long time and, yeah. <laughs> and ended up with a C-section anyway. Um, but I definitely feel like <clears throat> I felt differences in my body after that second pregnancy. Um, I think the research is pretty um, consistently saying that we don't necessarily see structural change in a curve at, like during and after pregnancy, or if we do, it kind of resolves itself. But I definitely felt, I felt different after that second delivery. Um, But that's when I found SHRA. Like that's when I I found this form of PT and it changed my life again. And so I learned how to do this. Um, But I think now on the other side of all of that, I've become much more aware of just how we can prepare those of us with scoliosis and those of us with effusion how we can best prepare our bodies for a healthy, pain-free pregnancy and delivery. And then like a, like a recovery, Mm -hmm. because as you well know, and probably everyone listening well knows like scoliosis impacts literally the whole body. And we just, we are slightly different. We have differences in our bodies than somebody without a scoliosis and we just need support in different ways. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah. yeah. Um, I, what, I kind of want to go back just a little bit, maybe kind of a lot of it, uh, to what (laughs) you were saying about people's ability to get an epidural or not. And that's something Mm -hmm. that is, you know, a big kind of sticking point for a lot of people that have scoliosis. They're not sure what determines whether Mm -hmm. or not they're able to have an epidural. And can you explain that a little bit further? Absolutely. So I think um, there is such a wide 
variability in, I think it depends on, I mean, everyone has a slightly different scoliosis. Everybody has different curvatures. Every hospital has different protocols. Yes. And then within that, I think it ultimately goes down to the specific anesthesiologists and their comfort level with their ability to provide an epidural without injuring someone. Um, because there is a, you know, a real risk of they could potentially, if that spinal cord is in the wrong, like they could actually cause some issues, you know, like a little bit of nerve damage and things. So I think just like anyone else that works in the medical field, they're trying not to provide, they're, they're trying their best to make sure they don't cause any harm. Um, but even within that, I've seen a lot of patients at this point that were able to get epidurals without an issue. Mm -hmm. um, I think the concern is more depending on that, especially like that, like the edge of the, the lower lumbar spine, like usually if they do an epidural, it's at like their very specific level in the lumbar spine. And it depends on how much rotation there is, you know, they want to be able to make sure that they can really, they know exactly where that needle is going. Cause I don't know if you've seen them, but they are giant, yeah, they are. <laughs> massive needles. <laughs> um, and I think that most of us can appreciate that you want, um, you want to know where that needle's going and you don't yes. want it to go places yeah. that it shouldn't go. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I think for the majority of people that have a fusion or like, a, you know, a lot of rotation in the lumbar spine, I think that's something that they would want to just consult with mm -hmm. an anesthesiologist in the area where they're going to deliver to just get an opinion. Yeah. Um, because like I said, depending on the situation, it may be no issue. Or if you only have like a thoracic scoliosis and the lumbar spine is not really involved or the, you know, I think that there's a wide amount of variability, but I think that is one thing that regardless of who I'm seeing, like I see a lot of, you know, women that are childbearing ages that are curious about pregnancy. And then they ask me about that. And I just say, I would, <laughs> I would talk to the anesthesiologist because it may not be an issue. But yeah. it may be. And if it is, then you just want to be prepared that there are, you know, there's other, there's the prepping for a natural birth, which is what I did, or there's IV meds, but just that you can't hang your hat on the epidural yeah. train unless you've, unless you've gotten that figured out. Yeah. Yeah. Can you also speak just a little bit about uh, your experience with having a spinal fusion and doing the scoliosis specific work on yourself? Um, like how you've seen um, any improvements in your symptoms? Uh, what What is the benefit of doing that if you've had a, a fusion? A lot of people, you know, they're like, is there even a point? I'm fused. I can't really make any changes. So mm -hmm. Um, I will say I, um, I like to joke that, I mean, my fusion is old enough now that it could like rent a car. <laughs> <laughs> like my fusion is, it'll be, I think it's 27 years old right now. I mean, it's been most of my life. My back has been fused. So I used to, I used to make jokes that I kind of forgot that I had a fusion. So I'd go like snowboarding and be like, why can't I twist? Like, why can't I? <laughs> so all that to say, um, I, of course, I learned these exercises later in life. I'm sure that there's a certain amount of just stiffness that kind of happens because I'm I'm in my upper 30s now and my spine has been fused for a long time. <clears throat> so part of my issue is like I have more stiffness, but I think the thing that I always have been concerned about is especially like even though I have a fusion, I still, so those <clears throat> muscles, they still can work on being balanced. Like we can still balance those muscles out. I've still noticed that my rib hump can, it actually, it's better. And certainly the concave, like the areas that sink in, those are better when I do my exercises and my pain is better. Like I don't have, I'm blessed to not have a lot of pain, but I do sometimes have pain. And <clears throat> when I'm consistent with my strengthening and, you know, certainly bone density, which I know is something that you've spoken about before on the podcast, like I feel more confident and, and better and less pain when I do my exercises. And I think one of the big things that is in the research now, they say is more of a concern is like the joint integrity at the joints that aren't fused. Mm -hmm. um, and like just making sure that my spine is really stable and strong. I feel, I feel like I, I feel better. I look better. 
and I feel less concerned about what I'm going to look like when I'm much older. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that that is really profound for people to understand from somebody that actually has experienced it and lived it. Um, you know, I can talk to I'm blue in the face about it, but you know, you've actually felt that in your body and you've seen, you know, those changes happen. So, um, I think that's really powerful. Um, can you talk a little bit about some trends that you've seen with, uh, patients that you've worked with who have scoliosis or spinal fusion and, um, kind of, maybe their propensities for certain pelvic floor conditions over others? Certainly. <clears throat> so I think um, one of the things that I, I feel like there's this general consensus of like even medical professionals that like they kind of feel like scoliosis is unrelated to everything, right? So I know I'm... <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I, I feel like I have a hard time breathing. Oh, your, your scoliosis isn't involved. Um, yeah. Or I feel like, I don't know, one hip feels way weaker. But so if we think about when we have a scoliosis, there is a certain amount of like, usually the pelvis is having to compensate for a curve. So instead of uh, we, like, I like to use the block example, which maybe you've spoken about before um, on the podcast before, but if we think about a spine without scoliosis, everything is all stacked up, right? So you have your head and your shoulders over your spine, which is all in a straight line over your pelvis. Everything is in a straight line. Everything is, it's symmetrical on all sides. When you have at least part of those segments that are twisted and rotated, there's compensation that happens at the other segments. And when we think about the pelvis and the pelvic floor, there's muscles on the underside of your pelvis that we have a left and a right. And so there's a lot of important jobs uh, of the pelvic floor. So there's obviously keeping you from like keeping you continent, keeping you from having an accident. They have a role in sexual function. They have a role in our core stability. They have a role in breathing and in lymph flow. Like they have all these important jobs. And now one side like we may have asymmetrical forces on one side or one side may be slightly overworking or, you know, disadvantaged and the other side may not be, or there's like, there's just asymmetries there. And um, those muscles are also impacted by our, our hip strength. And we know in scoliosis that usually we have asymmetrical hip strength. So if you have like the glutes or like those back hip muscles that are weak on one side, that pelvic floor is having to compensate and usually it's getting like over like over tightening or overworking. So sometimes someone with a scoliosis may have what feels, so sometimes they have more leaking or more pain or um, difficulty with like constipation because those muscles are really overly working and over tight. Um, you may have what feels like really low back pain, but it's actually coming from the pelvic floor muscles because that pelvic floor is over, like it's, it's working all day, all night. It's like squeezing within an inch of its life. And then where they feel the pain is like the low back, but you feel in that area on the low back, they're like, oh, that's not actually the pain because it's not actually coming from the back. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's like the pelvis is having to compensate. And you think about like the foundation of your house. So if you have, if your pelvis is your foundation and it's kind of tipped to one side, you think about how that impacts everything else. Mm -hmm. So it's just the, the pelvic floor is the floor of your core. And if your floor is wonky, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it can cause other issues. Do you see a lot of those issues resolve as a result of um, doing their scolio exercises and learning their corrections? Or is it more so you have to go in and release certain things in order for them to? change? That is an excellent question. I feel like for the majority of people that are experiencing issues, it, at, if nothing else, everything will get a lot better. Even sometimes resolve when we start to balance out some of those imbalances for some people, just like with any other, you know, type of muscle issue or muscle pain, they may need some internal work to actually resolve those issues, but mm -hmm. they may not. Um, there is 
like a slight, uh, the research is kind of a little bit mixed, but there is a slight um, increase in pelvic floor, like tension and, and pain with people with scoliosis. Uh, but really, you know, most people, they may not even realize that they have a difference, but even without scoliosis, there's a certain population of people that already have like a lot of overactivity and like kind of tightness of those muscles that have symptoms already, like pain with sex, um, a lot of like urgency to go to the bathroom, leaking, like even without a scoliosis. Mm -hmm. So that there's like a little bit more of a propensity for that if we do have a scoliosis. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we have a little bit of time left and I really want to hear about tongue ties and their potential connection to scoliosis. Can you yes. tell me a little bit about that? <laughs> Okay. So, um, I think the main, I, I kind of became aware of this, uh, um, my daughter very briefly when she was born, she was born granted, like right at the beginning of the pandemic, she was born April of 2020. And so <laughs> it was already a stressful time. And she just, she has a very fiery personality. Um, so I think part of this was just her, but we were having a really hard time with breastfeeding and nursing. And, um, after a lot of struggles, a lot of battles, I found an excellent lactation consultant who diagnosed her with tongue tie. And, um, I, I can recommend uh, some different resources for people, but the short story is, um, tongue tie is actually much more involved than I think at least I even realized as far as our ability to calm ourselves, like there's this whole, the vagus nerve, which is like the, the digest and rest um, nerve throughout our body. Um, when that tongue is bound down, we can't really get that. That tongue is actually supposed to live at the top of our mouth, which I didn't know. Cause I also have a tongue tie, but um, <laughs> so I was just, I kind of, as I learned about all of this, I was plunged head first into this world where I started to make these connections that, oh, when we have a tongue tie that impacts, like that puts tension in our whole body and kids like babies with a tongue tie have more of a propensity for like a torticollis and tension where they, they have like asymmetries in their neck or in their spine and torticollis, we know, is associated with a scoliosis. So I started making these connections like, oh, wow, you know, and I realized I also had a tongue tie. I was diagnosed basically when my daughter was with a severe tongue tie. <laughs> um, and when, um, so kind of fast forwarding a little bit, like I, I was preparing for my own tongue tie release. And um, I, when they were doing the procedure, I felt like I was numbed up, but I felt there was a cord on my right side that when she released it, I felt it. And I was like, wow, I had a really bad tongue tie on the right. And I have a scoliosis to the right. And it was just crazy. So I was doing all of this kind of, you know, incidental stuff within myself. My son also has a tongue tie. He also has a scoliosis. Um, so I decided, you know, there's a lot of research in the, um, in the like airway world. So airway jaw, like that's all, there's this whole research world there that we don't really have time to dive into. But um, I started just assessing with the patients that I see, okay, like just asking for ENT history and starting to ask, okay, did you have like adenoids tonsils removed? And so I, I learned how to start screening for, like I put those things in my intake forms. I'd have a lot of people that would check it. And then I would ask them about, okay, well, did you have speech when you, like, did you go to a speech therapist? Because also we know that people with a tongue tied generally have more issues with um, speech production and things like that or swallowing. And then I learned how to look at someone's tongue and see, okay, are, are they limited? And like looking at their jaw space. And I started to notice oh, wow, there are people that do have issues like this. And so I would start referring out to like airway focused dentists and myofunctional therapists who work with the tongue. But I started, so I'm, I'm doing like in my little corner of the world, I'm starting to collect this data on there is an association. Mm -hmm. And so I 
one of my pet theories is I think that one of the reasons my scoliosis progressed as quickly as it did was because I had all of this tension from under my tongue. And I think instead of, you know, it's slowly getting worse over a period of time, I think it just, it all, like I hit a growth spurt and it just, whoop. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's <laughs> amazing. And it makes complete sense. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. So what led to you actually getting the tongue tie release? Because I think that that is not as common in adults to get actually get the release done. Right. What really led to that? Um, I, the, the short story is I started to notice bite changes um, in myself. I started to notice, and I, I knew part of it was probably scoliosis, but I started to notice a lot more because I tend to like clench my teeth, like when I'm stressed or at night and I grind my teeth. Um, and I started to notice that I felt more pressure on the right side. And so, um, I started to see, I've been to a whole slew of people at this point, but I started to learn that when you're clenching and grinding your jaw and when you have a lot of headaches, like when you wake up and stuff that can be associated with like airway issues and like your jaw being too small. Um, and so for me, I apparently already had um, it was common back in the nineties that they would really only expand one, like the upper jaw and not the lower jaw. So I had a different, like I had a larger jaw on the top than on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And so I started expanding my airway because I was like, well, I bet a lot of these headaches and this grinding and like that, um, I was kind of afraid of what my future would look like. Like, could I, would I lose teeth if I like didn't address all of this? So between that and just the amount of pain I was experiencing with headaches and stuff, I decided to go ahead and start the process, but it has been it, two years <laughs> already of expanding the jaw and then doing tongue exercises to try to get my tongue at the roof of my mouth. And, mm -hmm. and the headaches have like, as I've worked on all of that, the headaches have gone down. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that by doing all this work, it's also going to help prevent me from like my scoliosis from getting a lot worse as I get older. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of an investment. Like I've tried to be, I've tried to invest in the health of like my jaw and my spine as I get older. Yeah. 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 Wow. Um, this has been such a wonderful conversation. I feel like I could keep talking to you for longer, <laughs> but we don't have the time today. Maybe I'll have you back on. Um, yeah, I love that. So uh, how can people work with you? How can they find you? Um, well, right now, everything is a little bit. So I am currently like a one woman show as far as um, I do have a website that is kind of under construction. It's <laughs> it's drlauraglazebrook.com. Um, I'm uh, very active on Instagram. I try to put out a lot of just kind of general info on scoliosis, pelvic health. Um, I have like some highlights saved about like my airway journey and what I've been doing with my son who also has scoliosis and all of those things. Um, and that's at laura.g.dpt. And at some point I will be putting together, I'm working on a webinar for people with um, scoliosis and spinal fusion and how to prepare for pregnancy and like a smooth delivery and um, postpartum recovery. And so that is, it's, it's being made. It's more just logistics of getting all that together, but I'm hopeful that, um, that will be ready to go in August. <laughs> um, and that actually, that will feature Dr. Beth, I think a little bit, she's going to help me put together some exercises for recovery after baby comes. So yeah, that's probably the, those are the two ways to find me. Right. Amazing. And then finally, can uh, you share what you're doing right now that is ahead of the curve? Oh, gosh. I think um, the biggest thing for me right now in my life is I just, I'm, like I said, full-time working mom. I've got projects I'm working on on the side. I've got family. I'm just, I feel like my schedule is booked literally all day. So, so what I've been trying to do for myself is I just, I don't take a lot of unwind time. So I've tried to be really intentional these past several months of, I have an hour lunch break usually, and I will try to get outside and just walk for 10 minutes. And I try not to take, you know, earbuds right now here in Atlanta, there's a lot of beautiful blooming flowers that I can go around and look at and just try to take like 10 minutes mm -hmm. to just let 
just to walk in silence and to observe the beauty around me, mm -hmm. um, trying to set myself up for just a little bit less hustle and bustle and a little bit more time to have gratitude and silence and appreciation for the world around me. I love that. That's so important. Take her advice. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. I, it's a, it's easy to skip. I'm like, oh, but I could do another note or, or I right, could, you know, right. call back this patient or whatever. But yeah, it's a, it's an investment. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again for joining Laura. Um, it was great to have you and hear all of your wisdom and wonderful experience. Um, until next time, I hope you all stay ahead of the curve. Thank you.